Hello, I am Dr. Leia Lise, and I call, and I'm known as the Shameless Psychiatrist because I'm all about parenting and living without shame. And today I am here with Jennifer Littner from uh, Embrace Sexual Wellness, and we're doing a live. Very excited about it, and I am going to let her in in a moment. Um, here it is. Today, we are going to talk about teens and dating, which is very exciting. Hi, uh, Dr. I Lee. <laughs> hi, I was just introducing you. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, tell me a little bit about yourself, and then we can begin our discussion. Sure. So I am a sexologist. My background is in sexuality education and in psychotherapy, doing couples and relationship and sex therapy. And I do a lot of education work with caregivers and parents around how to talk to children about sexuality and bodies and healthy relationships. And um, I also operate a wellness center called Embrace Sexual Wellness, hence our Instagram handle. Well, that is amazing. I love it. So you're the perfect person to talk to about this subject, which is teens and dating. I think a lot of parents want to know uh, how to handle, like, when their teenager is ready for dating. Mm -hmm. um, what if their teenager is older, not really, you know, clear as to what they want? Or what if you suspect they might be out of the box? These are some uh, questions parents might have. And listen, if anyone wants to type in questions on the chat, feel free, because I know there's a lot of parents out there struggling with these issues. Uh, what do you find in your practice comes up uh, in teens and dating? I think the primary things that come up are related to consent and boundaries and communication. A lot of times teens don't want to talk to their parents about their like intimate lives. And if they have a crush on someone or starting to date and they're at the same time, where are they also they're going to get that information from? So it is important to be able to help them have an outlet of who to talk to about that. And as a caregiver, how, how to express what it is that they need to know before they kind of go down that road. Yeah. Well, let's, let's break it down for each of those things. I mean, I think a, a lot of the questions that parents give me all the time is like, how do you know when your child's ready to start dating? Like, is there an age? And, you know, I would say there is no age because every child develops differently. Mm -hmm. And some are ready to date when they're way younger than others um, yeah. because of their maturity and social maturity level. I've mm -hmm. had 15-year-olds who are, like, really socially mature. And I've had, you know, 17-year-olds are just tipping the iceberg of maturity. But I think there are certain things that I like to really look at. And um, that is, their, the, you know, that they have knowledge of body autonomy, that they mm -hmm. understand um, the risks and the need for pro protection. They've identified mm -hmm. a safe space, uh, you know, for the dating or for, you know, if there's any, you know, sexualized behavior that goes on and that you partner with them in, um, and in kind of the process because breakups can be really hard. What do you think about sexual initiation, you know, dating and sexual initiation for teens? What are, what do you tell the families you work with? Yeah. Well, I think first and foremost is understanding what healthy relationships look like and being able to help explain to teens what, what that looks like, what there be through modeled in your home or also through examples and being able to help them understand, like just in preventing any kind of dating violence and things mm -hmm. like that. How would you know if, um, you like somebody or if somebody liked you, like what would, what would it be like? How would you know that? Um, mm -hmm. And also like, what, what would you do if, if somebody wasn't being nice to you, right? Like healthy relationships are about people really liking, caring for each other and being respectful and respecting each other's boundaries. And I think being able to understand what the teen already knows or doesn't know is a good place to start. If yeah. you haven't had those conversations before. Asking questions. Yeah. Yeah. And I think like, you know, really explicit explanations about consent, but like, mm -hmm. remember how we were, well, when I was younger, we had the bases, like first yes. base, second base, third base, and then home run, which I think is uh, actually kind of cute. But uh, I think there has to be like, um, consent obtained verbally for each of the bases. Like, okay, you know, can I kiss you? Can I touch your breasts? Is it okay? You know, is it mm -hmm. okay if I, you know, touch you with, you know, touch your, you know, labia or you're down there. Nobody's going to say labia, you know, down there. It's okay. You know, is it, yeah. um, is it, you know, is it okay if I put my mouth on you there? Like, you yeah. know, it's this verbal consent. It's not just, oh, is the other person going to swat your hand away because you were like, 
you're, you know, taking, tar- you know, taking liberties when you shouldn't, yeah. it has to be verbal. So that's something really important to tell your kids directly to do. For sure. And I, I think there's this piece around explicit consent that a lot of times asking children, like what, or teens specifically, what do you, how do you define consent? What do you, when you think of consent, what do you mean? A lot of times people think, well, it, it's absolutely yes, it's absolutely no. And there's this also a lot of nonverbal communication that happens. And I think being able to help teach teens that if somebody's pulling away from you, that might mean that, that even if they say yes, they like that might be confusing. Yeah. Um, and so being able to read and look out for nonverbal communication, because so much of our communication as human beings is nonverbal, that I think it's an important piece to be able to help um, teach teens about what it is that they might be observing between their peers or, or um, potential partners. Yeah, I love the idea of nonverbal communication versus verbal, but it also might not be a no, it might be slow down or, you know, mm-hmm. I'm not, I'm not sure how I feel about, you know, it's mm-hmm. like, you, you, it's a great idea to just check in and be like, oh, you look a little hesitant, what's going on, what's in your mind. Exactly. So that like, these are the things that you can really help them. Because I think, first of all, like parents feel a lot of shame around yeah. talking about this with their kids, but also the kids feel shame. Like they feel like it's mm-hmm. taboo to talk about sex directly um, because we have, um, we have just internalized that, you know, throughout all these subliminal messages that it's, it's not okay to talk about it and it's not okay to do it. And, mm-hmm. you know, and so they're so reluctant and, so giving them permission to communicate and say it's normal, it's natural, it's healthy, it's a good mm-hmm. thing, you know, mm-hmm. um, will help them be able to date and like um, say, you know, I like the idea of, okay, you go on a date as a, as a girl or a boy and you can say this is going to be like a waste up date, you know, like I, I really like you, we can experiment, but it's like waste up, you know, it's kind of mm-hmm. setting those boundaries ahead of time. That will yeah. make me, and, and if you agree to that, then we can go on a date. But if, if you don't agree to that, then. It, this isn't for me, you know? Yeah. I like to think about the, like talking about in terms of what we're up for, what we're open, open to. So um, I'm open to, to going over to your house and watching a movie and cuddling mm-hmm. on the couch. I'm open to seeing how I feel. I'm open to, to um, continuing to talk about this or I'm open to making out, but I'm, I'm not open to do anything else right mm-hmm. now. Is that okay with you? Um, and so it's just like negotiation of what it I is love that, that you feel open for. I think that language can be helpful for teens, but also for adults. Yeah. Oh, yeah. This is all relevant to adults. I mean, you you give people permission to set boundaries and the language in which to do so. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, for children and adults, it's actually kind of funny because it really, it really um, correlates to COVID right now and how, mm-hmm. you know, we're all negotiating our boundaries in terms of who we see and what circumstance outside, inside, here, there, have you been tested? It's kind of like mm-hmm. the very similar discussions to, you know, what's going on with this, with, uh, with dating for teenagers. And so we're all, whether we're married or in partnerships or, you know, for a long time now going back and learning mm-hmm. what it was like to be a teenager again and negotiate these these uh, mm-hmm. and negotiate consent around getting close to people. So we're all yeah. somewhat in the same boat right now. So you can yeah, it. I think that's a great point. And I, I mean, I also see that happening down where bully too, with like how far apart are people standing? Are they leaning in? We, you know, people used to handshake, hug, et cetera, mm-hmm. you know, and now it's, are some of somebody leaning their shoulder in? Are they mm-hmm. standing back? Right. We can, we can really tell um, a lot from nonverbals. And then I think following up with that verbal piece too is really important. Yeah. So um, tell me about the nonverbal communication more. Like, how do you suggest that teenagers develop, you know, because like I have a lot of kids with autism in my practice. Mm-hmm. They're really not very good at picking up nonverbal yeah. cues. So right. dating is more complicated for them. How do you sure. suggest you deal with that? You know, like a parent or a teenager, yeah. what advice would you give them around dating? Well, I think that this kind of goes back to social emotional learning. So we know that there are certain kind of behaviors people engage in when they're experiencing their emotions. So if someone's frustrated or angry, they might, you know, put their arms like this, or they might, um, you know, kind of be looking, if somebody is feeling disengaged, they'll be looking away. And so being able to ask kids, like, how do you think somebody might respond if, if, they're, if they're angry or if they're not interested in you? What do you think that they might like, exhibit if, if they're not saying it? I think that most um, 
but many kids can identify those things. I think it's also important, obviously, if you have a neurotypical child and being able to um, in, in reinforce the verbal pieces is an important part there. But there are certain signs like that, um, drawing away, sitting further, further away from somebody, um, not being as responsive, quivering of the voice that indicate and, or could indicate how somebody is feeling. Yeah, that's a really good, good point. Um, you know, it's fu funny. I mean, as much as we talk about, uh, you know, how we want teenagers to delay sexual initiation until they're older, mm -hmm. actually, um, we're seeing a little bit of the opposite problem right now, which is that yeah. teenagers are delaying their sexual initiation to later 16, 17, 18, uh, going up from 16 because, uh, a variety of factors that aren't necessarily healthy. Of course, if you make the mm -hmm. choice to delay that, it's a good thing, but mostly because they're uh, engaging so much in social media. They're not uh, actually face-to-face -face with their peers. They're doing a mm -hmm. lot more viewing of pornography. Um, they're being given a lot of cultural messages that you shouldn't get attached to someone when you're in high school. It'll never go anywhere. So what's the point? Yeah. So then they're not like forming these intimate relationships, which are, I think, critical for the development of mm -hmm. future intimate relationships. It's just like practice, especially mm -hmm. when they're safe. So I'm actually a little worried for teenagers right now because I feel mm -hmm. like we're moving a little bit backwards. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that and what you're seeing. Yeah, I think that's a great point, and it's something that I've come across in my research as well, and just how formative relationships can be at, during adolescence to kind of predict the patterns of intimate relationships down the road. And I think being able to, um, as caregivers, create opportunities for teens to have face, as much face-to-face -face relationship as possible. So working through things like um, conflict, um, you know, what, how do you know if, if like somebody gets too close to you or if something's, it doesn't feel good to you that I were to do, um, maybe it's, you know, a tone of voice I used when I, when I asked you to put your laundry away and that didn't feel good for you. There could be a way in which you could actually have a conversation about that. That could be, uh, I think useful with, with other relationships down the road. So I think using like at home, if, 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 if teens are with you at home, I think there's opportunities there. Um, and I think with, with regards to, um, you know, outside of that, using, using media examples to help I guide these conversations. I love that. Yeah. Social media, you know, is fraught with issues because obviously you just end up comparing yourself to everybody, but they can be used as a teaching tool. Like, mm -hmm. you know, how do you feel about what you're seeing on social media in terms of how that person is carrying on or, you know, mm -hmm. fighting or, you know, dealing with people around them and what, what kind of messages do you want to send out to the world? Because mm -hmm. that is, you know, a learning tool. Like, do you agree with how that person's behaving? Do you not agree? You know, mm -hmm. and being very open to that conversation rather than just being like, you know, don't watch that or don't do that, you know, is yeah. important. And I, I love uh, also asking how people feel, like, how do you think this person feels if they're in a fight or like on TV? And how do you think this person mm -hmm. feels? What do you think that they, you know, what would you want them to do differently? Yeah. Like if they could have a yeah, different ending. Right. I think that um, we really want our kids to have intimate sexual relationships when they get older and that mm -hmm. starts young. And that means they have to learn how to negotiate conflict. So it's like, you know, teens and adults actually are having way less sex than they mm -hmm. used to. Um, and, uh, and that is because they're in less intimate um, relationships, like it's hookup culture. And so if you're trying to hook up all the time, you're going to have way less sex, you might have it with more partners, but way less sex. And that is not necessarily healthy for most people, because um, a lot of times, you know, being in healthy, you know, longer term, I'm not saying lifelong, but longer term relationships is, uh, um, is a model that has been shown to be the most protective against like depression and all those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So it's like, how do we encourage them to be able to negotiate conflict, to be able to stay in the relationship at least a little time, not saying forever, um, mm -hmm. so they can learn and practice. Um, and I love the idea that you were saying, like, use these like examples, like what happens in your relationship with your child is also going to play out in other relationships in their life. Yeah. And I think you bring up a really good point around hookup culture. And I think that this piece around um, the types of relationships people are in, 
in some ways, I think that one of the things that's so challenging about hookup culture is that not everyone's always on the same page. Some people want to actually have casual relationships, but other people want a more serious relationship, but they don't feel yeah. like that's something that's available to them because it's not popular or other people won't be interested in that. Yeah. And so I think that the negotiation work comes up when they can say, you know, this is what I, I'm really interested in. Um, and, in, in, you know, hanging out with you, but I, I really would like for us to only hang out with each other if the monogamous part is, is a value or, right. um, you know, I, to even be able to say that they want a committed relationship if that's what they're looking for, even if it's unpopular, because ultimately I think a lot of people from at least the research I've looked at a lot of times, especially as students get into sort of the emerging adult years they expect that their peers are having so much more sex than they actually are yeah. and it's this kind of the social pressure really plays into their decision making around this and so I think that's really hard and as a caregiver being able to normalize like you know all your real relationship what you want in a relationship is valid and like let's talk about what are the pros and cons of this and what to expect so you're not you know crushed with disappointment when you get into it yeah yes that's true um so what are some like so one thing that i've really taken uh mm -hmm. very seriously is this idea of uh where teenagers are allowed to have sex and i think mm -hmm. that um parents might know that their child is having sex but never thinks to ask where they're doing it mm -hmm. and obviously this represents a serious risk factor because mm -hmm. i have also seen a lot of teens get assaulted because they're having a sex at a party when there's drinking and someone else walks in and gets yeah. involved or, you know, okay. there's uh, someone is filming or, you know, they don't mm -hmm. know or someone's under the bed or it gets around school that this person did X, Y, and Z at a party. And it's just a nightmare, no matter which way you slice it. So I'm thinking to myself, well, the only really safe place for a teen to have sex is in their home. They can't afford a hotel. Where are they going to go? You know? Right. And it's like, you know, this idea that if your teen is having sex and they're not having sex in their, in your home, you're actually subjecting them to dangerous situations. So, mm -hmm. you know, you have to be comfortable with that as a parent, you have to give them uh, a safe space and it's absolutely okay to set boundaries around it. Like mm -hmm. not on a school night, you have a test tomorrow, or I need the other parent's permission, or, you know, these are the birth control I want you to use. I want this person to come in upstairs or, you know, mm -hmm. the basement, or I want them to shake my hand. I want them to come to dinner. Don't make a lot of noise to disturb the other children or make sure the other children are not present in the home. If they're younger children around, it's like, you mm -hmm. can create these boundaries and then you can have this, you know, safe um, sexual exploration for your team, which is what you want. And not only that, but it brings you close together. You get to meet the person's romantic partner. You get to mm -hmm. shake that person's hand. You get to welcome them into your home. You get to have some, you know, it, it's fun. And that's like a part of, you know, family life. And in, you know, the Northern European countries are very comfortable with that. But for some reason mm -hmm. in the U.S., we get very uncomfortable. And I think it is not for your team's benefit. So. Yeah, I would agree with that. And I think that being sexual for the first time within your home or your, your partner's home um, is it allows for greater access to their contraceptive methods, their methods, et cetera. And it's generally a more relaxing environment, which is better for um, any kind of sexual pleasure that could occur. Yeah. So, you know, I think well. that that generally is a safer place. And, and this crucial to talk about boundaries and being able to respect their privacy. I think a lot of times the reasons teens sneak around is because they don't have privacy. They don't have anywhere to go and they don't want their parents listening in on what they're doing with their significant other or whoever they're hooking up with. So, yeah. um, you know, being able to, whether it's the whole sock on the door situation or whatever it is that, that you have yeah. a cue in your family. Like, I think you can create a ritual around this. And as the caregiver, yeah. if there are younger children, I think making sure they're out of the way, not disrupting, you know, that's important for sure. Yeah. And that's, you could, you could do that the same way roommates do it in college. You can figure it out <laughs> yeah. in your home. It's like, right. it's not beyond. It's just mm -hmm. get, dealing with the shame that you might have around, Oh my yeah. God, my child is now a sexual being. It's like, it's subvert that shame. I mean, um, your child is a sexual being. Congratulations. You did it. You know, you made a healthy <laughs> child. Good for you. You know, yeah. what's worse is that your child 
isn't going to be sexual and won't have a romantic partner and have a horrible, you know, uh, yeah. sex life where they don't have pleasure. That's way worse, you know. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, we're not talking about very young children, 12 or 13, but we're talking about older children, older teens who are ready for the experience. And that's what we want, right? We want mm -hmm. them to be happy and healthy. Don't have ostrich syndrome. And you bring up pleasure. Talk about pleasure. Come on. I love it. Bring it on. <laughs> well, Pleasure I mean, at, at the end of the day, right, the, one of the main reasons why people are sexual is for pleasure. There are probably hundreds of reasons. So I'm sure that, you know, those of you who are watching could probably come up with many other reasons. But, you know, this idea that people are only sexual for uh, pro reproduction and to procreate is is completely not true. And also it's very heteronormative. Yeah. And that's that's not reflective of a lot of people. So, you know, really understanding that the reason why people do things, the reason why children touch their genitals at the age of three years old is mm -hmm. not because they're sexually turned on. It's because it's self-soothing. It brings them a sense of pleasure, right? And as children develop and teenagers, like there's a reason why people are going to be sexual and drawn to that. Yeah. It's, it feels good in our bodies um, for those of us who identify as sexual beings, right? And so I think it's important that we are transparent about that. It doesn't make any sense to lie about it. Um, and, you know, it's, I think children actually are, and teens in particular, tend to want to be more rebellious when they say, when they think that there's something to prove to you because it's off limits than if it's on limits. So that's something that I think is important to convey. Yeah, I mean, it's crazy how much masturbation has been shamed in our culture. Like it's, it's just, it's, it's like from the Catholic, you know, religion, you know, don't, to, you know, yeah. parents swatting away the kids, you know, baby's hands when it wanders to their genitals, mm -hmm. like, you know, uh, it, 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 it's like that shame around mm -hmm. masturbation starts from birth in a lot of cases and it just continues right on up and we have to stop the masturbation shame. I was reading um, a book, Sex in America and by Kellogg, the serial maker, and um, he urged American parents in the 19th century to take extreme measures to keep their children from indulging in masturbation, including circumcision with anesthesia, application of carbolic acid to the clitoris, uh, and that caused masturbation to remain taboo into the 20th century. Um, and when in the 1990s, when it was refuted, uh, some people were just shocked and disgusted, mm. despite the fact that the behavior is commonplace. And, mm. uh, you know, still people are shocked and disgusted. And to me, it's like, you know, it's just like we've got to get the shame out of masturbation in our culture. It is totally normal and healthy and good. It's good. It's good for the child. It's good for them to know what, how they work. That's the only way they're going to be able to explain it to anybody else. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. And I think, you know, it's it's really linked to a lot of benefits sexually throughout their, their lifespan, um, right? It's, it's sexual knowledge, it's body awareness, all of yeah. those things. And, body autonomy. And it's also right now with the pandemic, it's, it's probably your safe safest sexual mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> option, um, and, yes. you know, and it's something that's accessible and it, you know, it's, it doesn't have to rely on there being another person in the room you know, or, you know, another partner. Um, so in many ways, it's, I mean, I, I know I've been talking about this for the, of the whole pandemic, but masturbation is a, self-pleasure is a good, a good thing to be uh, promoting for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's good. It's good and healthy as, you know, privacy and go in hand and go and go for it. So these are all great tips for these parents out there. I don't know if anyone has any questions, feel free to type it in the chat, yeah. you know, but I think it's really important to like get over your shame and fear, get into that mirror and just ask the question a hundred times so it doesn't feel strange. You know, if your kid runs away and screams, no, 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 it's like, keep asking, like keep yeah. normalizing it over and over and over until they stop. It's like exposure therapy and psychology. Like, you know, it gets easier each time you do it. And just because the first time doesn't go well, doesn't mean you give up is like, keep asking, keep being open-minded, keep finding out, keep being mm -hmm. inquisitive. And because you can partner with your child along this journey and they, you, they, trust me, they're going to appreciate it later on when they tell their future, you know, partners about how amazing their mom or dad was to be so open-minded about sex, even though it might feel very strange in the beginning. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point. We, um, in my parenting 
course and online program, uh, it's called Building A's Talking About the Birds and the Bees. We have a uh, role play section where caregivers are presented with different scripts that they can use. And the idea is to talk to another adult caregiver and practice having these conversations because generally, like the more that we practice this, right, the, less, the anxiety does go down. It, it is that exposure piece. And at the same time, um, we, when we were creating this, we did some, some survey research with teens, both that we looked at some research that existed and was peer reviewed, but we also looked at um, a selection of teens that we knew and we asked them a bunch of questions. And, we asked, and the main question was, what do you wish your caregivers would have taught you about sexuality and bodies and healthy relationships? And every single one of them had said that they wish they would have learned something from their caregivers and they were, they felt like they missed out on that. And so I know that sometimes teens aren't always you know, jumping up their seats for these conversations when you approach them, but it's information that they need and they're going to be much, um, it's going to be much safer and probably more accurate if it comes from you than if it yes, comes from their, right their peer who they overheard this, you know, on social media and it wasn't a vetted source and then it went yeah. viral, right? Like, yeah, that, that. So uh, how do they find your course? Because that sounds awesome. Yeah, it's linked in our bio. So if you go to Embrace Sexual Wellness, uh, Instagram page. It's in our bio. It's called the Building Ease course. Um, or they can go to buildingease.embracesexualwellness.com. Great. This is yeah. such a fun conversation. Yeah. I'm glad that we had it. And, uh, you know, anybody can DM us with questions. Sure. And, you know, this is, uh, you know, great information. And you could check me out as well. Uh, shamelesspsychiatrist.com. And I did write a book, No Shame, Real Talk with Your Kids About Sex self-confidence and healthy relationships. So thank everyone for joining. Yeah. Take care. Thanks. Bye. Bye.